Fritz Lieber is widely recognized as one of the early masters of fantasy and science fiction in the 20th century. An abbreviated list of his professional achievements includes six Hugo Awards, two for novels, three for novellas and short stories, and one posthumous, one Nebula Award, and innumerable other prizes for various works. He has been recognized with Lifetime Achievement Awards by the World Science Fiction Convention, the World Fantasy Convention, the Science Fiction Writers of America, the Horror Writers Association of America, and the Science Fiction and Fantasy Hall of Fame. Lieber belonged to a generation of hard-working and prolific writers of speculative fiction that included Ray Bradbury, Isaac Asimov, James Tiptree Jr., Lynn Carter, and Joanna Russ. But despite his many successes, in many ways he was set apart from this group. His interests lay more in historical rather than scientific settings. He was indebted to the earlier generation of weird authors like Clark Ashton Smith, Robert E. Howard, and H.P. Lovecraft, the last of whom Lieber carried on a correspondence with in the final year of the great horror writer's death. Importantly, Lieber's formal education was in philosophy and religious studies. Although he failed to complete his divinity degree at the Episcopal General Theological Seminary in Manhattan, throughout his career Lieber would demonstrate his interest in mythic archetypes and supernatural belief. For all of these other accolades, though, Lieber is now best known for the two characters that will have the biggest impact on our class, Fofford and the Grey Mouser. In many ways, these characters provided the model for what immersive fantasy characters might look like. To begin with, their adventures were extremely episodic. Lieber unveiled them in dozens of short stories that spanned the years from 1939 all the way to 1990. As you may notice from reading the ten stories in Swords Against Death, it is possible to pick up any one Fofford and the Grey Mouser story and quickly understand what it is about. But at the same time, knowing about the characters from other stories makes reading individual tales that much more rewarding. The ease of access of each of the stories may well owe to Lieber's interest in archetypal characters. The tall, gregarious, but somewhat dense barbarian, alongside the short, wily thief, makes for an almost instantly recognizable trope. However, one of the things that sets Lieber's short adventure tales apart from similar stories is that these main characters develop and grow over the course of their adventures. This is rather like the equivalent of characters in game-based narratives leveling up as the players learn more about their abilities, but also come to realizations about the personalities of their fictional selves. Another of the reasons that Lieber's works probably appealed to the early gaming community was the nature of the specific subgenre of fantasy to which they belong, a subgenre Lieber himself referred to as sword and sorcery. Magic and the supernatural is very much real in these stories, but it also sits on the boundaries of the experiences of the main characters. As adventurers, they attend carefully to their equipment and provisions, as is made clear in this passage from Jewels in the Forest. Quote, the mouser carried a mallet and a stout iron pry bar in case they had to attack masonry, and made certain that candles, flint, wedges, chisels, and several other small tools were in his pouch. Fofford borrowed a pick from the peasant's implements and tucked a coil of thin, strong rope in his belt. He also took his bow and quiver of arrows. End quote. Anyone who's played a fantasy role-playing game in the past 50 years will instantly recognize how familiar this list of dungeoneering equipment is. But that's the point. Lieber published this story in 1939, almost 50 years before fantasy role-playing games would be readily available. It could well be argued that one of the reasons Lieber's fiction was so well-received was that readers reacted to the immersive qualities. There is an aesthetic delight in simply putting oneself into the shoes of Lieber's characters and imagining how one would manage the unusual challenges they have to face. Moreover, those challenges often take the form of dungeon-like settings, the towers of the jewels in the forest and the howling tower, the labyrinth of the thieves' house, the caverns of seven black priests, or the forbidden temple of claws from the night. <laughs> 
Early gamers, especially Dungeons & Dragons co-creator Dave Arneson, would quickly realize that these kinds of enclosed but complex architectural spaces would make ideal settings for heroic characters who could attempt anything, but who were limited by access to supplies and by the cramped quarters in which they had to operate. The overall setting of Libra's stories also looks ahead to fantasy gameplay in many ways. There is a stark contrast between the depraved metropolitan busyness of the great city of Lankmar, which we most see in stories like Thieves' House and Claws from the Night, as opposed to the outdoor adventuring that characterizes what are essentially the travel narratives of stories like The Bleak Shore or The Sunken Land. That contrast allows Lieber to emphasize different aspects of Fafford and the Grey Mouser's characters, much like modern, city-based fantasy games highlight role-playing and character interaction, while wilderness adventures highlight resource management and combat. These characteristics of the stories are shot through every narrative, so one illustrative passage from the story Seven Black Priests can serve for all. Quote, just beyond the outcropping was a low cliff, and at its base a cave mouth, slightly sheltered by a tall rock, perhaps two spears lengths in front of it. The mouser felt a great glow of anticipated content as he followed Foffer toward the inviting dark orifice. He had greatly feared, being numb with cold, aching with fatigue, famished, that they might have to camp out and content themselves with the bones of yesternight's birds. Now, in an astonishingly short space, they had found food, fuel, shelter, so wonderfully convenient." End quote. Notice the emphasis on natural features, the use of simplified description, the mouse are measuring distance in spears lengths, and the overall sense of desperate relief at finding any shelter in a wild setting. This would be incredibly evocative, especially for Lieber's largely urban readership who might have, at this time, only known of landscape as something that passes across a car window on a drive. Of course, Seven Black Priests brings up another legacy that Lieber's work would pass on to modern fantasy play culture, although here he is not alone. The priests of Keld in that story are very clearly racially black, with the implication that their ostensibly primitive society made them more vulnerable to the influence of the mountain god they serve in this story. Setting these characters alongside the Asian-influenced Mingul slave class, who appear in almost all of Lieber's works, we begin to get a sense for the systemic racism that informs his writing. This implicit understanding of racial determinism would, of course, become a fixture of fantasy storytelling, one that has only recently been confronted. It is worth noting, as well, that there is a fair bit of sexism in Lieber's fiction, although this is somewhat less frequent since female characters simply don't appear as often. The Fofford, Fofford and the Grey Mouser stories are, if nothing else, boys' tales of adventure, with their erstwhile lovers, Vlana and Ivrian, safely dead by the beginning of their adventures. As Fine points out in his study of gaming culture, sexuality was something that was often joked about but never taken much seriously in the largely male groups in which he played. Itself a problem since, as we will see, women were involved in fantasy game culture from the very beginning. But if there was no game-based precedent for Lieber's fiction, where did his ideas come from? Why do his stories work so well as a basis for role-playing adventures? This is where some of the tight correlations between fantasy and play, and particularly the relationships between collaboration, identity, creativity, and, intriguingly, higher education, really come to the fore. Because it turns out that Fritz Lieber had a great deal of help in coming up with the characters of Fofford and the Grey Mouser. While still an undergraduate at the University of Chicago, Lieber befriended another psychology major named F.C. McKnight, who put him in touch with the aspiring weird fiction writer Harry Fisher. The three formed a fast friendship, living in the other worlds of magazines like Weird Tales and Unknown. Eventually, in a series of weekly letters to each other, Lieber and Fisher started telling stories about alter egos who were based on themselves. The tall, athletic Lieber would become Fofford, the northern barbarian, while the short, bookish, bookish fisher imagined himself as the crafty gray mouser. Nor did they stop there. They started to describe the world of Nuan, in which their characters would adventure, and this is where the story really gets interesting. Together with McKnight, Fisher and Lieber began designing a board game based on the adventures of their heroes. The game was played on a grid overlaid on a map of Nuan 
a map which was made, by the way, by Fisher's wife, Martha. I won't get into the rules of the game too much, except to point out that this all happened before any of the official Lankmar stories had been published. So the basic outline here is that Lieber and his friends imagined themselves as characters in some of the magical, heroic stories they were reading at the time. They created a game, Hoisinga's Magic Circle, in which they could bring their own heroic world to life. And out of that creative matrix, Lieber would go on to create works of short fiction that would influence other readers to create even more complex play spaces in which they could make worlds that never existed come into vibrant life.